All right, so the first thing to understand is just where this, you know, this bigger map, it just takes up this little section at the top northeast of India. That's where most of the Lord Buddha's teaching took place, is in that area. The Buddha was born in Lumbini. Lumbini is just north of Kapilavatu. His hometown was Kapilavatu. His mother, that means Mahamaya, was on the way back to her hometown, which was up here, Devadaha. So halfway along, you know, before she could make it back to her parents' house, then she gave birth. So that was just about here. When the Bodhisattva left home, he traced this road down here, you see. This, this was the route that he took, basically, anyway, you know, we don't know the exact, you know, there's, there's no road there, of course. Also, an important thing, you know, at that time, have anybody been to India? Yeah, it's quite barren in India now, but in Lord Buddha's time it was not. It was like a complete jungle. You know, the whole area was forested. It's because of the uh, deforestation that you now see it. You know, it's all been turned, for one thing, into farmland. Uh, another thing, monoculture. Another thing, they've cropped the trees for, you know, for the wood. So, the whole area is devastated. I also lived in Madhya Pradesh, which is over here, for about one year. And basically, you can see right to the horizon. It's very flat land, uh, so you, the horizon is a long way away, a couple of hundred kilometers. You can see right to the horizon because there's no trees. There's, there's only uh, this agricultural land. So, the, so one thing is you've got to understand the countryside now is very different from what it was in Lord Buddha's time. It was a forested area. So these roads going, you know, down, there would only have been like, you know, like one road or something going through the jungle until you come to a settlement. Along the way there are settlements like Kusinara, Parva and things like this. But in between time, you would just be out kind of like maybe on a highway going through the jungle. Also can be dangerous because there were, you know, lots of wild animals around even until, I don't know if you've seen when the um, British were in India in the 19th and early 20th century and they used to go on these big game hunts and they, you know, they would bag like, you know, 70 tigers at a time like that, that's the 20th century yeah way back in Lord Buddha's time it must have been quite dangerous actually there must have been a lot of wild animals around of all sorts you know, tigers, you know, big cats of one sort or another. Elephants are not, you know, elephants when they've been tamed are of course okay. But in the wild they're not. They're very dangerous in the wild. And buffalo. Also these um, wild boar. These wild boar can be quite big, you know. They charge you as well. They can break your legs. They're quite vicious if they see you coming. So anyway, yeah, it could, could be dangerous, you see. So anyway, when, when he renounced, you see, he walked down here, and then, you know, there are also these rivers to get across as well. So, you know, there were, there were ferries, of course. But you could only, you know, you would only cross when the weather was right, because these ferries are not kind of, uh, you know, like the, like these big industrial type things that we have now, you know, they would just be basically, I suppose, like rafts, you know, wooden rafts or something like that. So he went down here, crossed the river, and then down to Vaisali. Vaisali is like a, like a very big area. This country here, the people here were called the Lichavi. So this area, that was their capital. And then down to here and cross the Ganges. Right, and then he came down to Rajagaha. 
you know, while he's a bodhisattva. That's where he met King Bimbisara. Do you remember he met King Bimbisara and then um, the king made him promise that when he'd attained enlightenment, he would go back and give teaching to the king. Yeah. He saw him walking um, for arms and, you know, he was quite impressive even as a bodhisattva because he had been a prince and so on. So the king sent somebody after him and they followed him back. Raja Gihar has got seven mountains around it. The bodhisattva had gone up one of those mountains to, to take his arms, I suppose, really, and to retire for the rest of the day. And the king went up himself, and then they had this little discussion, you know. And, and uh, the king then made him promise, you know, if you ever attain an awakening, then you must come back and teach, teach the king. From Rajagaha, he went down to Gaya, this Gaya area. This is mountains down here. And there are also these rivers, you see. These rivers are flowing this way. It's like they're going up, actually, but they're not going up. They're, act they're going down because it's mountains here. Yeah, so they're flowing down into the valley and then eventually will join the big river going to the uh, sea. You know, big, big, big rivers are, are never just by themselves. They always have tributaries. Yeah. There's, the Ganges has major tributaries, which are major rivers themselves, like this one. That's a major river, you see, and this one is a major river. But the Ganges is considered a bigger river. So when these meet, when they merge, it becomes the Ganges. These are... Uh, you know, where these big rivers meet, they're known, I think, as theatres. It's um, like meeting places, and they're, they're considered very holy spots. You know, you'll, anywhere like this, you'll find so many temples in India, because where the two big rivers meet, you know, they're, um, that's really a holy spot. And this is, the biggest, this is the biggest one here, actually. So then he made his way down into the jungles of Gaya. That's where he was doing the, really where he was doing the auster, austerities, where he was doing his austeric practices for six years. A lot of ashrams as well in this area. So the Buddha also stayed in these ashrams, you see, like Alara uh, Kalama's ashram and um, Ramaputta's ashram. And also, is there are other ashrams that he stayed in that are, that are mentioned there as well. Even after, he, um, even after the awakening, there's still reports of him staying, going to stay in various um, ashrams. So these teachers were teaching, you know, up to, um, up to certain levels, like Alara and Ramaputta had attained very high levels of samadhi, very uh, refined levels of mind. And the Buddha had gone there as a young ascetic, really, you see, just kind of uh, starting out on the path. But he, he'd gone, gone to these places and then he'd learned the teachings very quickly and he'd managed to attain to those levels very quickly but he saw that he had, it hadn't uh, led to awakening. That's basically the, the situation. So uh, after that, he went off to the jungle area and started on the austerities because there were, you can say in a way, that there were like three main paths, spiritual paths, that people were following at the time. The, the first one, we can say, is the Brahminical path of the sacrificial offerings. Later we'll also come back to this because eventually the Buddha comes back after the awakening and he goes to one of these ashrams uh, where they're doing these sacrificial offerings to Agni, to the god of fire.
And he converts those fire worshippers, you'll remember. Okay, so that was one, one of the paths. The second of the paths, you see, there must have been some of these ascetics doing a uh, high level concentration meditation paths. Yeah. There must have been people around that were practicing meditation at quite a deep level actually. And then the third path that was thought to lead to an awakening was the path of austerities. That means if you totally deny the body, it will free the, free the spirit or free the mind. That's the idea behind it basically. You suppress the body so the spirit is, you know, can become free from the senses free from the world yeah and then you have a free spirit you see that's what it, that's what it would mean like a free spirit even uh, now these kind of like heavy austerities still carried on in india as you you know if you went there you must have seen you know there's plenty of um, very serious ascetic practices still carry still go on in india to this present day so the buddha went went down and he also was doing these ascetic practices and uh, you know some of them were you know very very strict and very austere like just taking one bean a day in fact during that period you see there was a time when the buddha had become so emaci emaciated at one point the, 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 it wasn't clear whether he had died or not and there were kind of like bets being put on by the gods as to whether he died died or not but he was he was still still living but just by a like you can say by a thread really anyway eventually he made his way down to Uruvela Uruvela means broad sands that's what the, the meaning of that of that word is Uruvela but it was a jungle area Perhaps it was sandy, maybe because it was near the, this river or something, I'm not sure. Basically the situation was that by that time he had realized that um, this path of austerities was not working. It took a long time if you think about it. Other Buddhas didn't take so long, you know. This Buddha took six years before he realized that um, he, you know, this path was not working. Other Buddhas, in previous times, they only took a couple of weeks. There's a reason. There's a kamic reason for it. That he that he had to he had to go through these austerities for so long because of some bad deed that he'd done in a previous life, which obstructed his knowledge in this life. So it took him a long time before he worked out. This is not, you know, this is not working. But eventually, of course, he did. And he realized he had to take some substantial food. In fact, he, though, he only took, um, you know, he only took some milk rice. In fact, in other texts, you see, in our text, we, it just tells that Sujata uh, gave him this one meal. He went to the Bodhi tree and he obtained awakening. But in other texts from the early tradition, it doesn't tell like that. It tells that many people gave him meals. And that's kind of more, more reasonable, you know? He must have had time to build up his strength. You don't build up strength on one, one meal of milk rice, you see. He must have had time when he was building up his strength and then getting that kind of balance back in the body. And then he would have gone to the Bodhi tree. But when he went to the Bodhi tree, he did make this kind of like uh, strong adittana or strong determination that he wasn't going to m move from that Bodhi tree until he had attained awakening. Then in the first first watch of the night he, he realized what's called Pope Nivasana that means recollection of former lives. Yeah. He could remember all his lives going back actually aeons and aeons and aeons. So long. In, in, in fact it tells a hundred thousand aeons, which even when you put together don't make one immeasurable, but there were four immeasurables. So four immeasurables, it's asankaya, 
you can't even measure it. So long. Four immeasurables and 100,000 aeons he'd been going through sansara. So people say, quite, quite a reasonable question actually, well the world is not that old and we don't, we don't, you know, archaeology doesn't go back that far. Right? But there's not just this earth. As long as you think there's only this earth, then you know, it's really an impossibility. But you know, this is a vast universe. It's full of Buddha realms and full of you know, different places where you can be reborn and so on. So just on this cosmology, you know, they, in, in, in Buddhism we have this idea of an evolutionary period and a devolutionary period. We're going through a devolution at the moment. But at the end of the devolutionary period, the universe comes to an end. And then it restarts again and you go into an evolutionary period. That start of that evolutionary period is like the Big Bang. So science can only go back 13 billion years to the Big Bang. But that's just the start of the evolution and then we go into a devolutionary period. Very much I find people have like a small earth perspective. It's like, the, you know, it's like flat earthers. In, you know, before, before the time that they worked out the earth was round. We, we live like that. We think there's only this little earth and there's only this little bit going on and like this, you know. But the universe is actually a really vast place. And there's bodhisattvas going through all, all, all these different realms as well. The night is divided into three watches. The first watch, the middle watch and the last watch. So in the second watch, he gained what is called Dibhachakka. That means the divine eye. With the divine eye, he could see the arising and falling away of other beings, not only himself, but of other beings according to the deeds that they had done. So that's another kind of insight, you see. You see that you, you, you yourself have been reborn, you know, but then you see that everybody else is going through the same situation. It gives you a real perspective on, you know, the nature of reality when you see what is happening and, you know, beings are at different stages and different levels. People tend actually to kind of criticize people because they're not very developed. But that's just their position at the present time in samsara, you know. The, 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 perhaps the reason that you're more developed than they, than they are is you've been longer in samsara, so you've got nothing to boast about. <laughs> he's a newbie. You know, he, only just, he only just came onto the scene and already he's you know, doing okay. Where you've been there for you know, so many un immeasurables and you know, you're still there. <laughs> so you can, you know, it gives you a perspective where you can put aside that kind of judgmental mentality, I think. You just see where people actually are. That's just where they are. That's it. And then in the third watch of the night, then he realized Paticca Samuppada, which means, you know, this. It's a special case of why suffering arises and how suffering dissipates or is ended. Paticca Samuppada describes Samudhya, which is the arising of suffering, and Niroda, which is the cessation of suffering. So it's those two noble truths. But you have to understand, if he understood those two, he understands all four noble truths. You, you can't realize the arising of suffering if you don't realize suffering. And you can't realize the cessation of suffering if you don't realize Nibbana. So by dawn on that morning, then he had attained complete awakening. Having fought off Mara's, ar Mara's armies and everything, you know. He, he fought those off before, um, you know, before all, all these um, knowledges arose, yeah. You have to, in fact, it's, it's, you see, in a way, these are mythological stories, but they're very meaningful. Mara represents the defilements. You cannot realize past lives. You can't realize those things if your mind is full of defilements. 
It's only when you've purified the mind from defilements that you can realize these high knowledges. So in, in like a pictorial form, that's what the story of Mara with his hosts of demons and temptations is going to the Buddha. That's what it's illustrating. Having put aside the defilement, completely purified the mind, he was able to realize these knowledges and gain awakening. That's what it means. In all of the Buddha story, you know, you've got to look behind the outward story and see the inward psychological mo uh, meaning as well. All of it is telling a psychological story as well as telling a kind of outward material form story. It's all telling an inward story as well. So you've got to see behind the kind of shadows, the shadow play of these things happening like Mara's armies coming and all this sort of thing and see the psychological reality that it's trying to describe in a way that people can visualize it. That's why, you know, the Buddha story, it's the most powerful story, I think. It's the most powerful story you'll ever hear because it's not just telling an outward... The outward story, of course, is heroic and it's, uh, you know, it's a tremendous story and everything like that, but it's telling a psychological reality as well. And it's that that gives it this power. It has this kind of mythological embodiment of what was happening to the Buddha. That's what gives it so, so much power. Now one thing I wanted to mention, but I should have mentioned it at the beginning, but I forgot about it, so I'll mention it now. Okay, which is this, which is a very interesting and very uh, significant point, which is that the Buddha is actually the first historical person. He's the first person we actually have a history of. Before that, there are some teachings from this teacher, and there are, you know, some uh, verses that are remembered that somebody said, but they don't know anything about these people. There's no biography at all. There's no biography of the kings before this time. There's no biography of the sages before this time. The first person who emerges in history is actually the Buddha. And even that, you know, is nearly accidental. In a way, it's kind of accidental. Because these stories, like the Mahakandika, what it's trying to tell, that story, it's, it's telling about how the uh, ordination uh, sequences were, were established and things like that. It kind of, it almost incidentally, t you know, to be able to do that, it tells the story of the Buddha, you see. So you get this biography in the first year of the Buddha's life. After that, there, there are recordings, the Buddha went to Sarvati and he stayed at the Eastern Monastery and he stayed in the gabled house and he gave this teaching. But there's nothing much more about it. Or he met with this Brahmin and he had this conversation. But we don't know when that took place. It's not a bio biographical situation. So, but this first year is described in the Mahakandika because it's describing how the lineages and how the Vinaya started, right? That's their purpose in telling that story. And then the, the next real biography that we get, really kind of strong biographical period, is actually the last year of the Buddha's life before he attains Parinibbana. Because people were not telling biography in Lord Buddha's time, you see. Biography was not considered important. Teachings were considered important. Like mantras, verses for the gods, they were important. But exactly who gave them was not important. So I think that's, that's a very interesting thing. For me, that's always struck me very strongly, that the Buddha is the first historical person that we have any real records of, and we know anything about that person's life and what he did. Because it's the Buddha, it, 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 it also happens 
um, you know, the, 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 the first person is also, really from our point of view anyway, the most important person. It's also the most important person in history. I think myself, you know, looking at it objectively from the outside, I, I think the Buddha is just the most important person in history. And he's also the first person in history. So the Buddha, after he attained awakening, he spent seven weeks. Well, anyway, we think he spent about seven weeks in this area. In, in this early text, the Mahakandika, it tells actually about four weeks. Uh, but just because it doesn't speak about the other things doesn't mean that they didn't happen or anything. But it doesn't tell in there. Those other weeks, the three other weeks, come in later texts and they fit them in. In the, in the first week, he just spent like a week reflecting on Patija Samupada and all the kind of significance, all the kind of ins and outs and connections that come together with it and what it actually means, you know. So he spent like a week reflecting on Patija Samupada. So it says in the later text, not the early text, the second week he spent looking at the Bodhi tree in gratitude. Yeah. Just being thankful to the tree for what it had you know, for the cover that it had provided and so on and so forth like that. In the third week I think he actually uh I think he's walking. There there was like a bridge made in the heavens and he walked he, he did this walking meditation, walking up backwards and forwards over the bridge, you see. On the, then the fourth week, then he realized the Abhidhamma. Yeah, so then in the fifth week, that's recorded in the early text. In the early text, it looks like the second week, you see. But in the later text, it looks like the fifth week, because they fit these, other, fit these other things in between time. Then uh, there was a storm coming up, so Mochi Linda who was a Naga god. Naga means like a dragon. You've all seen, you've all seen the picture with these seven hoods. And then he, he covered over the, you know, to keep him dry and to keep him from being uh, inconvenienced in a way. See, what it's telling in, in, in that story really is that the Nagas were the kind of like local gods that were worshipped before the Lord Buddha arose. So what it's kind of telling is now the gods are coming and protecting the Buddha. The Buddha is higher than those gods and these gods will just protect the Buddha. So he protected him during that storm that uh, arose for one week. In the seventh week, then Tapusa and Balaka, the merchants, came. He was still in this area. Now Tapusa and Balaka were merchants from Orissa, that's down here, and they were going up here to Rajagaha to sell their wares. And as they were going along the way, well, you know, they heard about the Buddha, so they decided to go and pay respects and they took um, rice cakes uh, to give to the Lord give to the Lord Buddha and they were the first people to go for refuge also quite interesting because they were merchants and they were you know they were on this journey to go and sell their wares but it's interesting because you know the main supporters for the sasana throughout the Lord Buddha's time that he was teaching was actually the merchant class. And it's the merchant class that also took along the Silk Road. It was because of those Silk Roads that the, that the monks were able to travel along and go to China. They were also trading down here. It's called the Dakinapata. So they, down those Dakinapata it means to the, to the uh, south. So they went down these seven roads and everything like this. 
That's actually because through the merchants that the that the sasana was established, the kings and the merchants, and then it's also because of the merchants that the sasana spread as well. If those roads were not there, there's nowhere to send anybody. So it's interesting. And they went for refuge to the Buddha and the Dhamma. There's no Sangha. You can't take the three refuges. They took the two refuges. There's no Sangha to take refuge in. A Sangha was still to be established. He was still here. Then Brahma came to the Buddha and requested him to teach. Because the Buddha was thinking, anyway, it tells, the Buddha was thinking maybe people can't get this, you know, maybe it's too difficult, they can't get it. So, also you see, now the Brahma is, the Nagas are the head of the folk cults, what we could call the folk cults. That means the local, you know, the local gods in the area. Yeah? So they had already kind of paid homage in their own way, protecting the Buddha. Now the head of the Brahminical divinities comes and then you know gets down on one knee and requests the Buddha to start teaching. You see, what it's telling psychologically, if you like, what it's telling is that now the, the, the local gods are paying respect to the Buddha. Now the Brahminical gods are also acknowledging that the Buddha knows more than, that, more than what they know and that he has to do, make this teaching. Uh, if he makes this teaching, people can attain Nibbana, but they can't attain Nibbana through the Brahminical religion. Psychologically, that's what it's telling, you see. We have this idea of the Brahma God coming down. So, you know, it, it can be true as well. You know, the gods come to somebody with purified mind, of course, like this. But, but what, the, what it's telling is that the Brahminical gods now pay respect to the Buddha. So, the Brahma God, Brahma Sahampati, requested the Buddha to take uh, to t start teaching and then the Buddha after he considered it the Buddha agreed to agreed to make that teaching and then he looked round to see who was worthy to teach so he, he thought of our Lara Kalama who was his first meditation teacher you can say but our Lara Kalama died one week before and the Buddha, Buddha was actually said, you know, it's such a, he said something like, it's such a shame. If our Lara Kalama had heard this teaching, he would have attained enlightenment immediately. But he didn't get the chance because he'd already passed away one week before. And then he thought of Uddhika Ramaputta, who was his next teacher. And also, Rama had passed away the night before. And he also thought the same thing. If you know, if he'd have heard this teaching, he would have been able to attain it enlightenment straight away because he was already at a very high level. You see, he just needed like the trigger, you know, the, the, yeah, just like the push, just to kind of you know fall into it because the mind would have been very purified. You see, so he they, he was not there either. Then he thought of the group of five. Ascetics. So then, with his Buddha eye, he surveyed northern India, and then he he, uh, he knew that the five ascetics were staying at Isipatana, north of Varanasi. It was the capital. It's the capital of Kazi. That's a different state. Magadha is where he attained awakening. Yeah, Kazi. It's a big state. It's like this sort of size. It was one of the biggest places in um, northern India at that time. So that's, that's the state of Kazi, and the capital was Baranasi. So this is about from here, which was the area where he detained awakening to there, is about 200 kilometers. You can walk about 25, 30 kilometers a day if you if you kind of, you know, if you're going. So this take, you know. It says about a week, you see, because what, what we know is this, 
uh, the Buddha attained awakening at Vesak and he gave his first teaching at Asala, which is in July, the full moon in July, two months later. So in, in, in the early text, it just, gives, just only tells you about four weeks. Yeah. It doesn't say that there's only those four weeks, but it only tells you about four weeks. So the commentary has built it up so it's seven weeks. And at the end of those seven weeks, he very quickly goes across to Isipatana, you see. In fact, in the commentaries, in the Pali commentaries, it tells he did it in one night. I don't believe it myself, because in other early, other early texts, it, took, it tells it took a week. And a week is a reasonable time, you see. And it also tells who gave him dhanas on the way during that week, and who he met. Then he went into Varanasi, and uh, went Pindapat, because this was the major conurbation, the major built-up area. And then he went out to Isipatana, which if you've been, you'll see is about um, 15 kilometers outside. Uh, it was a deer park, and that's where he met the disciples and gave the first teaching. So this is two months, a lot of time around here, six, seven, eight, six, seven weeks in this area after the awakening then say a week to get across and then he's there and he gave the uh, Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta in which he describes the Four Noble Truths and the uh, Eightfold Noble Path which are the kind of core, core teachings that the Buddha had discovered see that, that was the Buddha's big discovery was the middle path before then, there was this extreme asceticism or indulgence and the Buddha discovered this path that goes by the middle. You're neither, you know, neither starving the body nor indulging the body, but just kind of maintaining it in a reasonably healthy way so the, uh, the mind can also have a chance for development. So that, that was the teaching he gave. But at that time, only one attained to the first path. Only Anya Kondanya attained to Sotapanna. There were five listening, the others didn't get it. Not straight away. And then afterwards, the Buddha would continue teaching, but we have no record of that teaching. All that teaching has been lost. You now you'll be surprised if later when I, when I, when I tell you how, how long all this goes on and so little teaching that was remembered. But the Buddha was teaching every day and eventually the other monks also attained Sotapanna and then they attained Sakadagami and then they attained Anagami. After a week all five were at Anagami stage. That means they're non-returners. They're not going to return to this world. If they, if they were to die at that time, they would get reborn in the pure lands, and from the pure lands they would attain Nibbana. It's at that point that the Buddha taught the second discourse that we have recorded, which is the Anattalakana Sutta, the discourse on non-self. A very important discourse because when the monks heard that discourse, all five of them attained awakening. Yeah. It's on the realization of uh, anatta, of this non-self nature of the uh, human person, that the first people ever attained full awakening, you see. So that, that's why it's actually a really important teaching in, in a way it's kind of difficult, but it's not really difficult, you know. But somehow it's kind of presented in a difficult way. It's always presented in this kind of abidamic context and everything like that. But it's not, it's not really such a difficult teaching. It can be presented in, in, in other ways, you know. And it becomes much more meaningful and everything. It's just like the person you are now is not the person you are when you're 16. If you look back on that person, well, you're a very different person. And the person you are now is not the person you will be when you're 70. 
you're going to be a very different person when you're 70. Yeah? And the person you are now is not the same person you were when you were in your previous life. That's what it means when it's talking about anatta. There's no permanent, solid, enduring entity. All there is is development. There's a developing personality. It develops through a life and it develops through lives. Like that. It's actually, it's, it's for some reason, it's always surrounded with all these kind of abidamic terms and everything like that. But it's, and it makes it so complicated and so kind of difficult for people to understand. But it's just, you can just understand as you've developed yourself during your life. So you've developed over lives, over many lives. But that's also a revelation, you see, because there was two ideas at Lord Buddha's time, which was, that the, and two ideas now also, yeah, which was, or which is, that at the end of the life, like the scientific idea, at the end of the life, then the first person dies and that's the end. There's nothing more. And the other idea is, you go eternally to heaven. You know, you become an eternal being. In fact, you always were an eternal being, but you realize your eternal destiny. Either you go eternally to hell, or you go to eternally to heaven. Like this. So, in Lord Buddha's time, these two ideas were there as well. Majjhima Patipada, the middle path, goes through that. It's neither that there's an eternal uh, entity, or that the entity that you are is cut off. What there is, is a developmental path. Normally our Sala full moon is in July, and July is when the rains retreat begins. And the monks stay for three months in the monastery. Yeah. So, same for the Lord Buddha. He spent that first three months at Isipatana, because it was at the Asala full moon that he taught the Dhammachakapavatana Sutta. So they've already entered into the rains retreat. So he spent the next three months. During that time, Yasa came out from Varanasi. Yasa was a rich man, also the son of a merchant. Again, you see this merchant class very important. He was the son of a merchant. He came out to Isipatana and then he heard the teaching of the Lord Buddha and he attained awakening as well. So at that point there's seven people awakened. Buddha, five monks and Yasa. After Yasa, his mother and father came looking for him. So when his mother and father came looking for him, eventually, uh, originally the Buddha hid him by his psyche power. He, he hid him away and then he, afterwards he, he showed him to his mother and father. Once he was sure that they would not want to take him back, you know, they kind of confirmed that if he had obtained awakening that they, they wouldn't try to take him back. Because, they, you know, all families want their sons, you know, to carry on the family and <laughs> this is the problem. So the wife, Yasa's wife, Yasa's mother, Yasa's father came out looking for him and they also attained to Sotapanna. And at that point they went for refuge. So they went for the three refuges because there's a Sangha now. So they're the first lay people to go for three refuges. Then Yasa's friends, four friends came, also from the merchant class, and they also attained awakening. So then there's 11. And then 50 of his friends from Baranasi also heard what was going on, you see. They heard that their friends had gone to this teacher. They've attained awakening, you know, and everything like this. So it's not unreasonable, I don't think. You know, if you heard that your friend had just attained awakening, they'd gone to a side or up the road or something and attained awakening, you'd go along with her. So 50 of his friends came out and they also heard the teaching. But we don't know what the teaching was. 
It, you know, there's no remembrance of this teaching. This is long before Ananda is on the scene or anything, you see. So, they all attained awakening. So there's 61 people have attained awakening at this point. And that's in the first three months of the teaching. Not the first three months after the awakening, but the first three months after the teaching started. At the end of the wasana, then the Buddha made this very famous, did this very famous thing, which was he, he sent all the, all the monks that he had, uh, that had attained awakening, and he told them, he sent them out and he told them, go and teach for the happiness of the many folk. Go, don't go by the same path. Go by different paths out into the various areas and start giving the teaching. So that's, what, that's actually what they did. They went out and they started teaching themselves because they had attained awakening as well. So they can also, they can also teach. So they were all sent out and the Buddha said, and I am going to go back to Gaia. Right, so he, dis he, he went on this journey back to Gaia. Now there's a very interesting thing about this. There's 60 other people who have attained awakening and we know the names of quite a, uh, quite a few of them, like seven or eight of them. And none of these monks ever appear again. They just disappear off the face of the earth. It's very odd. They appear in the commentaries, but they don't appear again in the suttas. So the Buddha started going back over to Gaya, and then there's another famous incident where he met the, th the good group of 30. This was 30, in fact they're romantic couples, 20, 29 couples who, you know, his boyfriends and girlfriends, they'd gone out into the forest to frolic, if we can say like that. So they, w they went out to frolic, and one of them didn't have a girlfriend, so he took a prostitute. But this prostitute took his money and ran away. Right. And then as the Buddha was going through, it was around this area somewhere, it must have been, you see, as the Buddha was going through, they said, have you seen this woman who, who's run away with, with this money and everything? Did you see her? And, and the Buddha said, you shouldn't be chasing after, the, after a woman, you should look for yourself. So, then he taught this group of 30 as well, and all this 30 also attained awakening. Those also we never hear about again. We don't know their names, of course, so they may have, may have appeared. But we don't hear about this group of 30 again. They also just disappear off the face of the earth. So he came back to Gaya, and that's where he meets the Kasapa brothers. The Kasapa brothers were Brahmins, actually. Kasapa is um, it's actually a Brahminical clan name. One of, them, one of these brothers had 500 followers, one had 300, one had 200, so there was a thousand of them. Not all living together, but living along this river. Living in various places along this river. One of the ashrams was an ashram with 500 of them living in that ashram. It's quite, you know, it's quite a substantial place. And then the Buddha went there and he asked if he could stay the night and they said, oh, and the Kasapa, it, it means um, Uruvela Kasapa gave him permission to stay. And he said he wanted to stay in the firehouse. And Kasapa said, you can't stay there because there's a Naga living in that firehouse. He'll, he'll, he'll do, you, do you damage. And the, and the Buddha said, you know, he, he's not going to be able to harm me. You know, it's okay, you let me stay there. So he stayed there and then there was this kind of contest during the night where they were you know, the Naga would flare up into like a big flame and everything and then the Buddha would flare up into an even bigger flame like this so they were, they were this, this kind of um, contest overnight and in, in the morning the, the Buddha got hold of the Naga and he put him in his, in his begging bowl and then he showed it to Uruvela Kasapa 
quite good. It's also like this, these kind of psychological stories again, isn't it? Because, you know, he's overcome the kind of, you know, he, he's demonstrating that he, he can overcome these local guards. He can tame them. He can even carry them in his arms bowl. In actual fact, he, in our text, it tells that he carried out something like seven miracles. This was one of the miracles. He carried out other sorts of miracles as well. Like, he, he went r right up to the Himalayas and he, he managed to get um, a mango and then he brought it all the way back uh, and, he, and he beat Uruvela Kasapa to the Dana Sala, to the dining hall. You know, he, he, he traveled 2,000 miles or whatever it is, you know, and man managed to do this, you see. So that was another miracle like this. He was doing all these kind of different miracles, kind of proving his um, superiority over Caspar because Caspar wouldn't accept that he was inferior to the Buddha. But eventually, he realized that the Buddha has more powers. In fact, Caspar, we kept saying, You know, this guy is very powerful, but he's not an arahat like I am. That's what it says at the end of each of these miracles. It says, well, he can perform this miracle, but he's not an arahat like I am. Seven times he says this. In fact, at the end, the, 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 the Buddha thinks to himself, whatever I do, this guy thinks, still thinks he's an arahat. I'd better put him straight. I'd better put him straight about this. And he says, you're not an arahat. You're not even on the path to becoming an arahat. And then Kasapa realized it's true. He's not an arahat. You know, the Buddha is an arahat, but he's not, an, he's not an arahat. He's not even on the path, but the Buddha can show him the path. So then he worshipped the Buddha. There's an interesting sequence to this. And then also converted the uh, other brothers and their uh, thing. And then he taught all these people were worshipping fire, they were fire worshippers, worshipping Agni. So the Buddha taught the fire sermon. It's the third of the uh, teachings that we have record of. It's the fire sermon, Ardita Pariyaya, where he describes what is really on fire. Yeah, what, what is on fire is, you know, what the, the important fire is not this fire, the important fire is the eye is on fire. The ear is on fire, the nose is on fire, the tongue is on fire, the body is on fire. It's on fire with greed, hatred and delusion. That's the third discourse, you see. He teaches these fire worshippers what a real fire is. All the way through his ministry you can find that the Buddha is doing this. He meets people halfway. You're interested in fire? then I can tell you a fire story. So they all attained, that's a thousand then, you see, attained awakening. And then from there, they went to Rajagaha because he had made a promise to teach King Bimbisara after he had awakened. So he went then to fulfill his promise. So he went back and he met with King Bimbisara. In fact, it tells that King Bimbisara and his courtiers and 8,000 Brahmins came out to meet the Buddha because they, the news had gone ahead. But they didn't know, is the, is, is the Buddha a disciple of uh, Uruvela Kasapa or is Kasapa the disciple of the Buddha? You see, they, they didn't know what it was on. They knew this big kind of uh, flock of saints were approaching and everything, but they didn't know which way around it was. So when, when they kind of met, you know, that means when, when these two groups met, then Uruvela Kasapa worshipped the Buddha. He said like this, you know, I am the disciple, you are my teacher. He told like this in front of everybody, so n nobody's confused about who is the actual teacher. Then it says, in the Pali, it says that the Buddha gave a teaching. But it doesn't tell what the teaching was. It tells that he, taught, he, he gave a teaching to this group, that means King Bimbisara and the courtiers and the uh, Brahmins. But there's no record of the teaching, you know. 
This is now two months to there, three months at Isipatana during the range retreat, uh, at least a couple of months to get back. So we're talking about seven months after the awakening. We're talking about winter time. We've only got three discourses recorded in seven months. Imagine what all those other teachings would have been. Would have been nice to know, eh? But we don't know. And then he gave the fourth discourse, but the Pali has lost the discourse. But in uh, Mahavastu, which is another early text, in there the fourth discourse is recorded. So I actually I translated that. Uh, because people don't know it from the Theravada tradition, from the Pali tradition, they don't know this discourse. But it's remembered in the other thing, and it's quite an impressive discourse as well. So that's the fourth discourse of the Buddha at that point. Then, coming towards the end of winter, they had also heard about the Buddha attaining awakening, in Kapilavastu, the news has spread. It's gone up from Rajagaha, it's gone through Vaisali, it's gone up to Kapilavastu. And his father wants to see him. And his family, I suppose. You know, but his father wants to see him. Because his father hasn't seen him for over six years. And seven years by now, of course. It must be you know, almost seven years. So the father sent down some em embassies to go down to Rajagaha and invite him to come home, come to Kapilavattu, and you know, he can give teachings there. The problem was, they sent down these uh, ministers and they took like a thousand uh, people with them, but they all attained awakening and then they didn't give the message. And that this, uh, uh, apparently it happened, you know, or supposedly it happened nine times. So there was ten thousand of these sakyas all stuck in Rajagaha, all of them awakened, and none of them remembered the message they were supposed to give, which is, you know, come back to Kapilavatu. So the next one, they sent down Kaludai, it means black Udai. Uh, they sent down Udai, which was who was one of the ministers. In the, you know, one of the Sakyan ministers. And he put cotton in his ears so he wouldn't hear the teaching. Before he, before he gave the, uh, before he gave the message. And then he, he gave the message and he described, actually in one of the texts I did, uh, one of the texts I translated, uh, Gina Charita, he gives a beautiful, uh, beautiful description of, uh, the springtime in in, in Kapilavattu, he's describing the springtime in Kapilavattu and why he should go home and, and see it, you know. You, you can all remember, well, you know, you're not, you're not in exile, I'm in exile. So I can remember spring in England, you know. It's really beautiful because it's all barren over the winter and everything, you know. And then during the spring, all the, uh, the snow's clear and then the uh, flowers come out and then the trees start blossoming and everything, you see. So if anybody wanted to get me back to England, they would have to describe the springtime, you see. So that's what Udayi did for the Buddha. He described the springtime in Kapilavattu. So then the, the Buddha, anyway, agreed to go back to Kapilavattu. So it's a long walk again, you see. It's about 300 kilometers from... 320 kilometers, I think I worked it out one time, from Rajagaha to Kapilavattu. It doesn't, you can't do it so quickly, you know. It's going to take some time. He went up to Kapilavattu, and then he, uh, he went on arms round in, in Kapilavattu itself. And the king, if you remember, was very upset, because the king was saying, you know, nobody in my family has ever gone for arms. You know, they, they're a princely family, they're a kingly family, they don't go begging as it's looked upon. But um, the, here is Siddhartha, who is Siddhartha Gautama, and he's going beg begging, you see, like that. And then the, the Buddha made this very kind of, um, in a way it's a poignant uh, thing that he said, 
uh, he, he said to the king, you're talking about the kingly lineage. Uh, the kingly lineage, they don't go begging, but I'm the Buddha lineage. Yeah, his primary lineage, that means his primary descent, is not his physical descent, but his spiritual descent. It's quite powerful in a way, you see. It c connects him up to all the previous Buddhas in, in, in his thing. And the Buddhas do go Pindapat. Yeah. So then the king, you know, the, he, he can't argue with that. You see what I mean? He, his lineage is, on the, is, is through the Buddhas. It's secondary that his lineage is through the king. And then he met Yasodhara. And then she also, you know, during that period, I think she attained Sotapanna at that point, uh, but uh, during, during that, later she also attained awakening and became very famous Arahant Nan. We have her verses in uh, the Terigata. That's the verses that the nuns gave after they attained awakening. There's a book in the Tripitaka called Terigata. Then his son also came out, and his son, seven-year-old son Rahula, his son was, uh, you see, seven years old because he had left seven years before. So his son was also asking for his inheritance. So again, you see, just like the king is trying to put the lineage through the material lineage, and the Buddha says it's not a material lineage that's important, it's a spiritual lineage. So the son was trying to claim his material inheritance, and the Buddha gave him his spiritual inheritance. He ordained him on the spot. Then afterwards, another interesting detail, afterwards, uh, King Sudodana said, you shouldn't just ordain people without getting permission. <laughs> And, and the Buddha said, yeah, okay, I understand that. That's perfectly true. They should have their uh, parents' permission before they're ordained. And even to this day, monks cannot ordain unless they've got permission from their parents. Yeah? You must take permission from your parents. That comes from the time when the Buddha just quickly ordained his son. <laughs> like this, and then his, his father complained about it. He said, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do that. It's not good, you see. You should get permission first. So the Buddha was very amenable, you know. If people would say, you shouldn't do this, he would consider it. And if he thought it was right, he would go along with it. And people say, so sometimes he, he, you know, in the rules in the Vinaya, many times he changes his mind, you know. People say, oh, this is not right like that. And he will change his mind and he will do it a different way. And they'll say, oh no, it's not right like that either. And he will change his mind again and he'll do it a different way. Many times in the Vinaya, he's very flexible. So, then the, the other person, that was Yasodhara has gone forth. And Rahula has gone forth. And the third person that was very important was his half-brother, Nanda. That means Mahapajapati's son. Mahapajapati was his mother's sister and also the person who brought him up. But she also had children of her own. One of those was Nanda. So Nanda was very, very infatuated with his wife. There's a beautiful retelling of this story by Venval Ashwagosa, uh, who was one of the probably the finest Sanskrit poet that lived. He wrote A Life of the Buddha, which is very well known, and he also wrote Saundarananda, uh, which is this story of how the Buddha converted his brother Nanda, or his half-brother Nanda. And Nanda was very infatuated with his wife, very much in love. But the Buddha, as he was coming from arms round one day, he gave, the, he gave his arms bowl to Nanda. And Nanda didn't know what to do, so he just followed him all the way back to the, you know, the forest where they were living, the place where they were staying, like that. And when he, when he got back, he, he ordained him, just like he ordained 
Rahul, you see. He gave him ordination. And then Nanda really didn't want to be ordained because he was in love with his wife and he wanted to go back to his wife. And he was thinking about his wife and he was getting thin and all this sort of thing. So the Buddha grabbed him by the arm and he took him to heaven. And then he showed him all the heavenly nymphs and, and he said, if, if you live the holy life in the way I'm teaching it, at the end of it, this is what you get. And then he said, who, who, who is more beautiful? You know, the, the nymphs in heaven or your wife on earth? Like that, he says, my wife on earth is like a disfigured monkey. <laughs> so he lost his lust for his wife, you see. And then he put himself into the practice, thinking he's going to get these nymphs at the end. He put himself in the practice and he really strove hard and he attained arahatship. When he attained arahatship, he went to the Buddha and, and he said, you know, those nymphs in heaven, I don't need them anymore. <laughs> I don't need any uh, heavenly nymphs anymore. Please release me from that uh, thing. And, and the Buddha said, the moment you attained arahatship, you were, you were released from any kind of vows or promises that you have made. It's also a nice story. This is told in uh, about 16 cantos, that means 16 books in, the, um, in Ashwagosa's story. But it's also told in our scriptures as well. But, the, but it's very elaborately told in uh, Ashwagosa's story. Very nice. So that was the third of his relatives. But also, the other Sakyans like Ananda and uh, Mahanama and all these others also, the princes, the Sakya princes, they also went forth, you see, and they also became uh, monastics at that time. This is still within the first year. After the episodes in Kapilavattu, then the Buddha apparently walked all the way back to Rajagaha. Now, monks are not allowed to, to ride horses. <laughs> they did go in caravans. But that means a caravan is like a caravanserai. It means, uh, you know, you would have had merchants with their merchandise piled up on wagons and on horses and on oxen, perhaps, like this. And then they would be making that journey. Now then, the monks are allowed to join those caravanserais, but they don't travel on the you know, they don't travel with the animals. They walk. Yeah. It would go at walk pace, you know. It takes a long time to get across the country, of course. But that's an important thing as well, because he went back to Rajagaha. Now, that was a major trading center. And Sawati, in the Kosala country, was another uh, major trading center. Sudatta who we better know as Anata Pindika, took one of his caravans and he went down to Rajagaha and that's where he was introduced to the Buddha. That's where Anata Pindika first met the Buddha was in Rajagaha. On one of his, you know, merchant trips to sell you, they would take goods, you see, from Sarvati, what they produced in Sarvati, take them down to Rajagaha, sell them, and then they would buy produce in Rajagaha and take it back up to Sarvati and sell it. And then Anata Pindika invited the Buddha to go to Sarvati. And it's said that, you know, he set up, you know, he set up way stations, set up way stations all the way along so that, that means they would have set up tents, you know, where there was food and drinks and cover provided so they could go. Because in fact, now when the Buddha went, he went with all his disciples. That's a lot of people, you see. You've got to, you, you, you can't just go into the village. There's a thousand disciples or something like that. You, you can't just go into a small village, there's not enough food. So to get all, that, all those monks and everything like that across, 
the back of India, probably 400 kilometers or something like that. He set up way stations along the way so that they would be, I think every 12 kilometers or something like that. Actually a big expense, you see, to provide food for all these monks all the way along. And then they went to, along this journey, all the way back, probably through Kapilavattu, and then back to Sarvati. Sarvati actually became the major teaching center. There were two monasteries there. Jaitavana, which was in the south, and what was actually called the Eastern Monastery. So we, we, we know where it was. It was in the east, you see. East of the city. But the first one was Jaitavana, which was made by or brought by Anatta Pindika. Originally it was Jaita's. Jaita was a prince in Sarvati. And he had grounds out side the city where he would go and frolic like these 30 people were frolicking earlier in the thing so he had these grounds all the rich people would have grounds outside the city where they could go and um, relax and uh, they may, may have gone hunting as well you know hunting enjoying themselves going to the rivers and you know all these sort of things so there was um, some grounds like this that belonged to Jaita and Anatta Pindika bought out those grounds you know the famous story where he put down they had these golden kahapanas like golden ringgits if you like and they put those ringgits on the ground covered the whole ground and bought the monastery and then it was given in dedication uh, from Anata Pindika, who's a very rich merchant, of course, because you can't put down money like this if you're not. And then the Buddha told, gave 30 garters, 30 verses, telling, praising Anata Pindika and telling how good these gifts were. And, uh, you know, but these, these verses also not recorded. There's some verses in the commentary. It gives something like five or six verses in the commentary. And they're really beautiful, really wonderful. Praising generosity and praising, you know, that kind of beautiful state of mind and so on. But the others, were, the others have been lost by the tradition. You see, now all of, all of this time, while all of this is going on, this is like the first year of the, year of the Buddha's thing. All we have is four discourses. See, so much was lost. When it got to Jaitavana, that's when the story broke off in the early text. We don't, in fact, the, the story in the early text breaks off earlier. It breaks off at Rajagaha. This story about going to Kapilavatu, back to Rajagaha, and then over to Savati, it comes actually in the later in the later books that means the Jataka Nidana the Jataka introduction and other books from that era doesn't mean it's wrong of course but they're not the early books they're not from the early teachings so but when it gets to Sarvati that's when it breaks off and then we don't that's when the biography breaks down and in a way it's kind of suitable because once Jaitavana had been established, really the Sasana was established. He had major support. As I said, I think for something like 25 was he spent in Sarvati. From the 20th to the 44th range retreat was spent in Sarvati. It became a major center for, it, for the teaching, you see. 24 years he spent in that. Some of it was spent at Jaitavana and some of it was spent at um, the Eastern Monastery. The Eastern Monastery was Visaka's monastery. Visaka was the main female disciple of the Buddha. Anatta Pindika was the main male disciple of the Buddha. So they were both, you see, in Sarvati and providing big support for the monastics. Uh, in that area and it was able because of that to support a big monastic community you see it's also a major city you know it's a major it's a major trading city so there's a lot of people there
so they can also support the thing. But they had two major supporters in that area, so where they could stay in these monasteries. And Visakha, if I remember rightly, one time said that she would provide cloth for the monastics for the rest of her life. So that's the the early story, the early biography of the Buddha's life. So there you go. Everybody say sadhu.